All right, let's do the lesson where we do some more differentiation rules for exponential functions. So in the previous lesson, you learned how to differentiate a basic exponential function, but now what we're going to do is apply what we know about like product rule, quotient rule, chain rule, all that stuff with functions that have exponential functions within them. So here I have a reminder about what chain rule is. So if we have a composite function, f at g at x, we can differentiate that by using the chain rule. We do the derivative of the outside function with respect to the inside function, so f prime at g of x, and then multiply that by the derivative of the inside function, g prime of x. How does that work with exponential functions? How do we use the chain rule with exponential functions? Well, when we think of the inside function, we think of the function in the exponent. So since an exponential function has a base where it's some number greater than zero, and our variable x is in the exponent, if that exponent is some function of x, we need to use chain rule. When differentiating an exponential function, we do the power multiplied by ln of the base. But then, like I said, if the exponent was some function of x that we could differentiate, we then have to use chain rule, which says then multiply that by the derivative of the inside function. And the inside function is the function in the exponent. So multiply that by the derivative of the exponent, g prime of x. Let's see what that looks like as we go through a few examples here. Now this first example, we actually don't need chain rule, we need product rule for this one. This is a product of two functions of x. It's an x multiplied by an e to the x. So I'll use product rule to find the derivative of this. So y prime equals, now when I differentiate this using product rule, it tells me to do the derivative of the first function. The derivative of x is one, multiplied that by the second function, plus do the derivative of the second function, and the derivative of e to the x is e to the x ln e, and ln e is just 1, so the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, and we discovered that last lesson. And that gets multiplied by the first function, x. So there's my derivative. It's just e to the x plus x e to the x. And I suppose we could write this in factored form if you wanted to, but you could leave it in standard factored form, we could common factor out an e to the x, and I'd have 1 plus x as my second factor. So I'd take either standard or factored form for that derivative. Let's try another one. This time we're going to have to use the chain rule, because we have an exponential function, right? The base of our power is Euler's number e, it's that irrational number 2.718 and so on. And the exponent is a function of x, 2x plus 1. So when I do chain rule for this, I find the derivative of the outside function with respect to the inside function. So I do that power multiplied by ln of the base, ln e, which is just 1, so I don't really have to write that. But then that has to be multiplied by the derivative of the function in the exponent, which we consider the inside function in this example. So the derivative of the exponent, 2x plus 1, the derivative of that is 2. So if I simplify this up, I'm just going to write that factor of 2 before the power of e, so I have 2, times e to the 2x plus 1. And I'm not going to write ln e because that's just 1. Let's try another one. This time I have two exponential functions being subtracted. So when I differentiate this, I'll just subtract the derivatives of each of those functions. So the derivative of e to the x is just e to the x, minus the derivative of e to the negative x, well, that would be e to the negative x ln e, which I don't have to write because ln e is just 1, multiplied by the derivative of the exponent. Right? The exponent is a function of x, so I need to multiply that by the derivative of the exponent. Derivative of negative x is negative 1. So if I simplify this, I have e to the x, and then minus, that's going to be a negative product, so I could write plus e to the negative x. Part D, this is a good one because it's going to combine our knowledge of differentiating exponential and trig functions. So if I want the derivative of two times e to the x times cos x, well, I could use the constant multiple rule and know that that's just going to be equal to two times the derivative of the product of those two functions of x. And the derivative of that product of e to the x times cos x, well, I would do the derivative of the first function. So the derivative of e to the x is e to the x times the second function, plus the derivative of the second function, the derivative of cos x is negative sine x, times the first function, e to the x. And let's see what we could simplify here. 
So notice both terms in the square brackets have an e to the x. Let me common factor that e to the x out. So I've got e to the x, and then divide both of those terms by the e to the x I took out, and I would have cos x plus negative sin x, which I'll write as minus sin x. So what I have is a 2 multiplied by e to the x times cos x minus sin x. Part e, I'll need product rule again. So y prime would equal the derivative of the first function. So derivative of x squared is 2x times the second function, 10 to the x, plus the derivative of 10 to the x, which would be 10 to the x ln 10 times the first function, x squared. And I'll notice both of these terms have an x, and they both have a 10 to the x. So I'm going to common factor an x, 10 to the x, from both terms. And what I'm left with is, from the first term, 2. And the second term would be x ln 10. All right, let's move on to some applications of this. Example 2 says, identify the local extrema of this function. So that means find any local max or min points. I know add a local max or min point, the derivative is going to be 0 or undefined. So let me start by finding the derivative. So f prime at x equals, I'll need to use the product rule. Derivative of x squared is 2x. Multiply that by the second function, e to the x. Plus the derivative of e to the x is e to the x times the first function, x squared. And then because I'm interested in when is this 0 or undefined, it's going to be useful to get it into factored form. So I'm actually going to set it to 0 and factor it. I could common factor an x and an e to the x from both terms. When I take that out from the first term, I'm left with just 2. And from the second term, I'm left with x. And now how can a product of three things be 0? Well, if any of those three things are equal to 0, the product would be 0. So how can x be 0? Would be if x was 0. How could 2 plus x be 0? Well, 2 plus x would be 0 if x was negative 2. And I skipped over the factor of e to the x because how can e to the x be 0? Well, e to the x can't be 0. If you remember what the graph of e to the x looks like, it has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. So of course it can't be 0. Now these two x values, 0 and negative 2, are what we call critical numbers. They indicate that on the original function, there's a slope of 0 at those two x values. Now that could indicate there's a local max, a local min, or it could be neither. We need to use either the first or second derivative test to classify these critical numbers as either local max or min points. And I should actually find the y values that go with these x values too. I'll need to do that at some point, so why not just do that now? So I'll plug each of those x values into the original function and calculate their y values. And I'll get Desmos to do that for me. So I found that 0 and negative 2 were critical numbers. And if we look at the graph, let me just show you. At 0, there's a local min, and at negative 2, there's a local max. And I got Desmos to give me the y values. Let me just jot down the y values, and then we'll talk about this graph a little bit more. f at 0 was 0, so the point 0, 0 is a critical point. And f at negative 2 was about 0.54. So the point negative 2, 0.54, is a critical point. And now, like I said, we could do first or second derivative test. But I don't think I'm going to do second derivative test because I don't want to have to differentiate that first derivative. I think it would be easier just to do first derivative test to classify these points. We want to figure out that at this point where x is negative 2, that it's a local max. And we'll do that by seeing that the function is increasing before and decreasing after, which means it has to be a local max. And I know that the first derivative, when positive, tells me the function is increasing, and when negative, the function is decreasing. So I'll test values of x around this critical number to see that the first derivative is positive before and negative after. And that'll tell me at negative 2 must be local max. Same reasoning for when x is 0. The first derivative will be negative before. I know that because I see the function is decreasing. And the first derivative will be positive after. I know that because I see the function is increasing. So that will tell me there's a local min at an x value of 0. And we'll set all of this up in a chart. So my first derivative test 
I'm going to need to make a chart which divides up my intervals based on my critical numbers. So my critical numbers were 0 and negative 2. I'll put them in ascending order. And I'm going to pick a value within each of the intervals I created here. So before negative 2, I'll pick negative 3. Between negative 2 and 0, I'll pick negative 1. Between 0 and infinity, I'll pick 1. And I need to test each of those numbers in the first derivative. And then that will tell me whether the original function is increasing or decreasing. So when I plug negative 3 into the first derivative, let's see what it equals. f prime at negative 3, I notice it's positive, And that's because at negative 3, the original function is increasing. So f prime at negative 3, I know it's positive, which means the original function is increasing. How about f prime at negative 1? Well, I should get a negative value because I see at an x value of negative 1, the original function is de decreasing. But let's get Desmos to calculate f prime at negative 1. And yes, it is negative, which tells me the original function is decreasing, which means at negative 2, there must be a local max point because it's increasing before and decreasing after. So if there's a local max at the point negative 2, 0.54. And then how about in my last interval between 0 and infinity? When I plug in 1, I know at an x value of 1, the function is increasing, which means the first derivative should be positive, And it is. First derivative is positive, which means the original function is increasing, which means at 0, there must be a local min. Local min at 0, 0. Because the function was decreasing before, increasing after, has to be a local min there. There we go. We found all the local extrema for that function. Local max at that point, local min at that point. Our last example for this lesson says the effectiveness of studying for an exam depends on how many hours a student studies. Some experiments show that if the effectiveness, E, is put on a scale of 0 to 10, then the effectiveness based on time, where T is the number of hours, is equal to 0.5 multiplied by 10 plus t times e to the power of negative t over 20, where, like I said, t is the number of hours spent studying for the exam. So if a student has up to 30 hours for studying, how many hours are needed for maximum effectiveness? So what we're looking for is the absolute max on the interval from zero hours of studying to 30 hours of studying. So when we want an absolute max on an interval, what we need to do are test the endpoints of the interval. So figure out what the effectiveness would be at zero hours of studying and at 30 hours of studying, and then see if there were any critical numbers in between. If there's a critical number in between, that means there may be a local max between those points that will give you a higher score than either of the endpoints. So we're going to have to get the critical numbers for this. And to do that, we're going to have to find the derivative of this function because a critical number is a number that makes the derivative be zero or undefined. So let me start by finding the derivative of this function. So I'll need e prime at t, and that equals, well, I can do the constant multiple rule. The derivative of 0.5 times that function would just be equal to 0.5 times the derivative of that second factor. So this 0.5 is just gonna kind of hang out out front the whole time. And the derivative of the inside, well, the derivative of 10 is just zero. I suppose I could write that, or I don't have to, plus the derivative of t times e to the negative t over 20. The derivative of that, I'll need product rule. The derivative of t is 1, multiply that by the second function, negative t over 20, plus the derivative of the second function. So the derivative of e to the power of negative t over 20 would be equal to e to the negative t over 20 times ln e, which is just 1. And don't forget chain rule. Then multiply that by the derivative of the function in the exponent. The derivative of, and we can think of, I should mention, we, should, we could think of negative t over 20. It's probably easier to think of that as negative 1 over 20 multiplied by t. And that would make it easier for you to see that the derivative of negative t over 20 is just negative 1 over 20. So using chain rule, we need to multiply this by negative 1 over 20. And that needs to be multiplied by the first function, t. OK, there's the derivative. And since I'm interested, when is this 0, it would probably be useful to get this second factor that's in the square brackets, get that into factored form. So this 0.5 is staying out front. 
And then in those square brackets, I'm going to common factor out, oh, they both have that same power of e. So I'm going to common factor out an e to the negative t over 20. And then in the brackets, I'm left with from the first term, 1, and the second term, minus 1 over 20 times t. I'll write that as minus t over 20. And how can this product be 0? Well, 0.5 can't be 0. This power of e cannot be 0, because we know an exponential function has a horizontal asymptote at y equals 0. But 1 minus t over 20 could be 0. How? Let's set it to 0 and solve. Well, I can see now that 20 is the answer to this, because that would make this 1 minus 1, which is 0. But let's solve it algebraically. Let's move that negative t over 20 over, multiply both sides by 20, and we get t equals 20. So t equals 20 is a critical number. To find the absolute max on the interval between 0 and 30, we should test the endpoints and critical numbers. So we'll need the effectiveness at 0 hours of studying, at 20 hours of studying, and at 30 hours of studying, because that's the max amount of time they had. So we'll plug each of those into the original function. And I'll do that in Desmos. Make sure if you're using your calculator, you're typing it carefully. So I'll just call the function f at x to keep it simple. So it's 0.5 times 10 plus x e to the negative x over 20. And let me change the window on here so we can see the whole interval. Here we go. OK, so we want between 0 and 30. So notice between 0 and 30, let me just restrict the domain. Notice at 30 hours of studying, looks like the effectiveness score would be 8.347. At zero hours of studying, the effectiveness score is five. In between there, there is a critical number. There's a local max at an x value of 20. The effectiveness score goes up to 8.679. So let's jot those values down. So e at zero is five. e at 20 is 8.679. I'll round that to 8.68. And e at 30 was 8.347. I'll write, round that to 8.35. So notice that the highest of those values, 8.68, occurs at 20 hours of studying. So let's summarize our final answer. 20 hours of studying are needed for maximum effectiveness. Okay, that's the end of that lesson. In the next lesson, we're going to learn how to differentiate logarithmic functions.